I've won championships, I've won titles without SNC. Why do I need to do that? We want you guys to play. We know it's your sport and your passion. We want you to play as much as possible and train as much as possible. It's exposure to different environments. Badminton, volleyball, gymnastics, parkour and bit set up. And this is the whole way through the academy. He was really comfortable being in body contact. And that just adds to your repertoire of techniques, skills that you can use, tactics that you use in your game to make you the style of player that you are. Rest, recovery, sleep, high quality nutrition, hydration, communicating with your coach. All fantastic things that you need to do and need to be consistent. And again, that, that's a joint up approach. Hello and welcome to Project Footballer episode 23. Today we are covering strength and conditioning in football. And we have an expert in this subject, Harry Nock. Harry is one of the Chelsea strength and conditioning coaches. He also has his own company um, called Advanced Performance, which is a specialised strength and conditioning gym based in Guildford. And he, after speaking to him and spending a lot of time with him, I know that he's got so much to teach on this important subject. Um, Harry, welcome. Thanks very much. Cheers for having Harry, me. Harry, welcome. Also with us today, we have Marcelo, a coach at Chelsea, and we also have Yuri, who is a scout at Fulham. And the guys also happen to go to university together. Yeah. Yes, so um, myself and uh, Harry and Yuri, we went to the same university. Uh, I think it was in my second year you came in. Yeah. We played in the same we did, football team. <laughs> Uh, and yeah, and then it's like after all these years, we've obviously been coming into Chelsea now. It's like we've come full circle, and now we've yeah we've come across each other again. Yeah, so it's nice to have you on the Cheers. podcast oh, to to share your knowledge. Yeah, no, thanks for joining us. Um, so yeah, I mean, just to start with, I mean, I think like it'll be good to know how you got into strength and conditioning. But before we do that, can you just define what strength and conditioning is? Yeah, definitely. I think it's that would be a really good place to start because I think if you ask different people, they might have a different um, definition of it yeah. or their idea of it may be different. Um, for me, it's more of a journey. So strength and conditioning is a journey of an athlete from a young age right and up until they go into their professional pathways um, and different sections of that journey are going to look different. So, you know, in that developmental stage and the f uh, f learning the fundamentals, it's gonna look completely different to the, when they're going through maturation and then post maturation is gonna look quite different as well. So yeah, it has different elements in it and it's again, multifactorial and, it, and there's lots of different parts to it. Um, but again, depending on where, where you are, what age you are and what part of your development you are, it's gonna look, look slightly different. Um, but what, is it like weightlifting? That's definitely a part of it. Right. So uh, resistance training is definitely a big part of it. Um, and it's how we segue into that from a youngster, um, how we uh, maintain the quality and consistency of that uh, resistance training and then allowing them to you know, prolong their career, essentially. Okay. Uh, and, and yeah, how did you get into this field? Um, a lover of sport from a, a young age, uh, played lots of different sports, um, which we advise our young athletes to do uh, currently. Um, football was the, my, my main passion, um, played football all my life, um, was lucky enough to be at AFC Wimbledon yeah. um, from probably 11 or 12 all the way up to 17, 18. Um, actually played with Ethan Pinnock, oh, um, yeah, yeah, who yeah. you had on the podcast yeah. uh, in the same youth team. Um, and then, uh, yeah, didn't play professionally, but then continued to play. And that, I think, started the passion for, you know, physical exercises, making sure what can I do to make sure that physically I can compete against, you know, when you're playing in a, in a first team against grown men, what do I have to do to compete um, physically? And that kind of sparked something in me, um, then led me to go to university and find out, you know, what is, what is behind this um, and what can I implement? Um, and that just that started off a, a love of physical development, uh, learning how to develop myself um, foremost. And then it kind of blossomed into, 
how can I share this now? How can I how can I get more of this? How can I help more people? Yeah. Um, coming out of university, um, started working f uh, with Advance, um, and at the time we were quite we we're in our infancy, so we had um, a few athletes with us. We would go into to schools and work with gifted and talented groups, um, and then it's kind of just snowballed from there. But um, the underlying theme being, you know how well I can then uh, gain knowledge and then give that back to these young athletes to, mm. to help to help their journey. And how long have you been at Chelsea for? Uh, I think this is my fifth season. Oh, is it? Um, so yeah, it's gone quite quickly. So, which is which is great. And uh, yeah, absolutely love it there. Great environment. Um, everyone pushing the same direction. Um, a really joint up approach to, to developing the person um, as well as the footballer. Okay, and at the moment you're with the Chelsea under 13s predominantly. Yeah, lead lead S and C coach of the 13s. Okay, so maybe um, and we don't have to like stick specifically on Chelsea, but with like academies, what is typical for like how many S and C coaches they'll have? Like, well, is that common that there'll be a S and C coach for each academy team? Or, um, or what's what's common? Yeah, at, at Chelsea, we we try and have um, a coach per team. Um, obviously, in different academies and different levels of football, that might not be the case. So you might have an SNC coach that's doing athletic development with the youngsters. We might then also cross over with um, up the age groups and into the youth team. Um, but as much as we can, yeah, we try and like to have that uh, one SNC coach uh, to improve the athletic development of, of one team. Um, just so you can keep the highest levels of detail, um, of feedback, um, communication with the coaches, monitoring um, the players throughout the season, um, and then passing that information on to uh, up and down the chain as they progress through the age groups. But so it's not necessarily like normal to have that. Will Arsenal, will Man City, will... Yeah, yes. They, I have to, they have to have an SNC coach to maintain the category status, uh, category one or two. Oh, is it? So, yeah, it's now a prerequisite. It's, yeah. it's a requirement. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. it's definitely, it, it, it definitely helps. But I also, um, in my younger years, having involvement with other clubs, know that that sometimes isn't the case with, you know, budget and things like that. It's really tough to maintain the amount of staff um, to keep, like you said, to keep that status. So, but um, but yeah, very much appreciate the, uh, the position we're in and the ability we can have to share information and, and work with those players are quite a high level uh, day in, day out. It's interesting because just hearing that, it, you know, and, and we'll come into this through the episode of like how important this is for player development. But imagine that you're at a category three club and you don't have that. And that they start to become like a bit of a gap between the players there and what they've got access to. Um, yeah, hundred percent. I mean, for example, if you're an, uh, an SNC coach and your attention is split across three age groups, automatically your contact times down across the season. Um, automatically, it's going to be really hard to maintain that level of detail, um, tracking youngsters through maturation knowing when maybe to to pull back on their training load, when to then communicate with that with coaches. You know, it's, it's a real barrier um, and something that's, that is really tough. I think it's that's why it's important um, with, with your company because those players can go to um, ADP and, and get the, the, the training. So that's what I was going to say, yeah. So I think if you're understanding that you're at maybe a disadvantage, let's say if you're in a cat free club. That or grassroots. Well, I was just about to go into that. Then after, um, after cat free, you then go into grassroots and you've got no SNC coach. Um, so then if the ambition of the parent is to catch up and maybe the player has talent, but is deficient in some areas, they've got to go out and source the right specialist. Um, and those specialists are, are out there because you're part time with Chelsea. And that will probably be common for like all the other Cat One clubs. They'll have part-time SNC coaches, and then chances are those people have their own companies as well. Yeah, is that common? Hundred um, percent. I think, like you said, we kind of feel that strength and conditioning, athletic development is for everyone, for every young athlete. 
Yeah. Um, no matter whether you are male, female, grassroots, um, or at the top flight, currently we feel that you know it's something that is tough to get hold of. Um, if you're a parent, you might not know who to contact, how, why I should be doing, how much of it I should be doing, should I be resting? Um, talking about sleep, growth um, related injuries, um, what do I do then? Um, so we really feel that it is for everyone. Um, and I think a big piece is just that kind of the education piece yeah. and just um, introducing yourself to people and making that information readily available um, for people if they want to. Because, you know, we understand that it is a new, young, growing industry, an area that, again, not everyone may know about. Um, and it's about educating people, getting the message out there that, you know, this is what we're doing at, at the, the top flight f with youngsters every yeah. week. Um, however, there's no reason that you can't do that as well. Really? Just because you're, you're not... The facilities that you've got at your gym in Guildford, how different are they from what you've got access to at Cobham? Uh, no different at all. Really? Really. In terms of, um, you know, we've got some high spec uh, technology and kit, um, speed gates, force plates, um, that we can do some some pretty intricate testing with and feedback. Yeah. Um, but then again, if you look at, you know, there's some really basic things that you can do that maybe aren't necessarily, you don't have to have that kind of technology um, to, to, to do. And in terms of, you know, our facility, it's it's up there. But that's probably what I'm interested in for like the families who are listening to this, maybe up north or not even in the UK or wherever they are. Um, they We want to try to like, give everyone the sort of level experience. Um, and so then, yeah, what do they do? Like, how can they like find a company like yours? Um, first of all, 100%, whether you, wherever you are in the country, wherever you are listening to this, there's things, there's principles that you can put in place to ensure that, you know, you give your young child the best chance of developing um, through a long-term athletic development plan. And that's how we kind of view it. Yeah. You know, it, it's a real zoom out and a long plan. Um, we often get people coming to us like, oh, I wanna get quicker in like four weeks. We're like, well, that's not, it's tough, you know, and there's things we can do to try and help you. Um, but we really need to zoom out and look at this in terms of a, you know, six, 10 year plan yeah. of where do we wanna be eventually? and what are gonna be the building blocks, um, the fundamentals, the foundation that we're gonna put in place to allow your athlete to then continually and continuously build consistently over time. So will they have like a, they should find a consultant, is that what you're saying? Yeah, I think maybe look for someone who's well read, um, someone who's open um, and someone who puts the athlete at the center um, and someone who can explain it to you in a way that is um, easy to understand. Mm. Um, like, you know, I speak to parents every single week and I think one of the, the key things is present it in a way that's digestible, easy to take away, um, and that they understand how to then implement those bits on a weekly basis, yeah. um, wh whoever it may be with. Yeah. Um, but yeah, someone who's well read um, and puts the athlete at the center. Does it? Do they need to be a specialist in football? Um, potentially, I think, you know, working at Chelsea and working with a lot of footballers of different ages, um, people tend to come to me and go, oh, I've got this footballer. Can you help me with him? Yeah, absolutely. Um, but there's loads of qualified, fantastic um, teachers, S&C coaches out there that no matter what sport, that they're currently in, um, they're going to give you some fantastic advice, fantastic advice to develop the athlete, the person over that long period of time, um, and then from those developing those athletic characteristics, hopefully you're going to have a really good footballer at the end of it. Mm. But there is a risk that if you got the wrong person, then that could do like quite a bit of harm. Y yes, I would say that. You know. 
seeking advice from different sources that may not be as reliable, um, listening to the volume, the amount of training that that resource tells you to do yeah. on top of everything else, then you might be looking into over fatigue to burnout, and then you're gonna look at, uh, at different injury effects that, that that possibly might have. So getting some solid sound advice from a really good source is a great starting point um, with, you know, especially with the amount of stuff that's out there at the moment, the uh, vast different places that you can get that information from, I think getting some good solid information from a reliable source mm. um, is your first port of call. Um, and what age did this typically start? So uh, um, going back to kind of our definition of S&C, yeah. it's that long journey, um, that long-term athletic development plan. In terms of where we start, we start quite young. So we've got sessions from um, seven years old. Um, but again, that doesn't necessarily say that's that's where you have to start. Um, we would kind of say athletic development would start as soon as they're able to- To crawl. Yeah, crawl to, yeah, yeah, yeah. So- Would you say that, I'd say so, if we're gonna go right back to this stage, would you say that maybe from, from when the baby starts to crawl or a baby starts to roll over or a baby starts to stand up and walk, is that part of development of, of strength and conditioning and are there tools that parents can maybe use to help their child? Yeah, I think f from the very beginning, it's all motor learning, it's all skill development. And you know that skill development doesn't really change. We're continually picking up new skills and that's based on setting up the environment. Um, can we consistently um, expose young athletes to different environments and then allow some sort of unstructured play to develop. Um, and then from that environment, you're gonna shape what adaptations you get. Um, for example, um, in, our, in our youngest class, it's very much unstructured play. It's, we're gonna play some um, invasion games. Then we're gonna play some hand-eye coordination, some dodgeball. Um, we're gonna get on the monkey bars. We're gonna play some tug of war. Um, we're gonna grapple and wrestle. Um, we're going to do obstacle courses. We're going to hit some parkour. So we're throwing loads of different stimuli at this young person and they're constantly taking it in. How do I get up and over that really tall box? Um, how do I most efficiently navigate this situation? And that's all feedback. Um, and if we can create really skilled learners, um, that's a fantastic foundation to have. Whatever sport they play, yeah. But you're, you've got a, a really skilled learner um, and someone who thrives in that environment and wants that environment. Um, you'll develop some, some really good characteristics as a base to then be a really good football or, or athlete in general. Are we doing this at Chelsea as well? Yeah. What age do we start at Chelsea? So from the eights, um, they'll have uh, exposure to different multi-sport. Um, so lots of different games, ways of moving, um, different stability, balance challenges, um, crawling, grappling. Um, we've got parkour and, and bit set up. Uh, and this is the whole way through the academy. They're, they're exposed to yeah. different games, hand-eye coordination, badminton, volleyball, really? um, gymnastics, um, a, a, as well as gym work and, and gradually blending that in. Um, but yeah, it's exposure to different to environments and individual athletes will, will And is it take like if we're, if we're training three times a week and playing a game on a Sunday, typically for under 12s and below roughly, I'm not sure what, what day they start going Saturdays, but um, on the training sessions, yeah, what portion of the session would encompass what you've just described? So, in terms of the on-pitch stuff, um, we will do portions of, um, again, that'll be broken up into sections throughout the year. But on-pitch wise, we're looking at doing some sort of like power, some bounding, plyometrics, jumps. Um, we do like carries and grappling and wrestling for body contact. Um, and then we're looking at some different uh, techniques and skills that would then cross over into the into the gym as uh, their strength and condition becomes more structured. Um, you when know. typically is that? So how measurable 
when do you start measuring and and comparing and sort of seeing trackable progress if that makes sense so we test normally three or four times a year in terms of their physical testing um we um would monitor their height and weight uh seated and standing and that's going to give us really good context so in terms of kind of rather than testing we like to call it kind of monitoring so we monitor their their development and when we see changes in that uh, development that's going to give us clues as to um, where they are in kind of their maturation and when to maybe um, step on the accelerator and, and, and start ramping up or equally backing off a little bit as well um, and again these are all it allows us context when we're, we're measuring throughout the year that's so interesting where you talk about that where um, it's, you just said that this it's the right time to really ramp it up can you maybe go into more detail on that because, sorry, to give a bit more context, um, someone told me that if your kid grows by more than a centimeter in a month, then you need to rest them more. Something like that, they said. Um, gr growth is like anything, multifactorial. There's lots of stuff happening. So it would be quite reductionist to say, um, if this happens, then this happens. Right. Um, it's because there's so many factors at play. Um, so, in terms of when to ramp up and when to, to back off. Yeah. Ideally, if we've, like we've discussed previously, we've got this young star who's really skilled, they've played lots of different sports, exposed to lots of different things. <clears throat> they've learned different movements, um, squat, lunge, hinge, push, pull, all this kind of stuff. And they've got a really good base. Then the earlier we can start teaching these uh, and, and kind of drip feeding these, um, strength movements um and it's really hard to get that time back so you know if you don't start this until you're 16 17 it's really hard to get that block of time where you could have been practicing slowly building um your resistance training your strength work all oh, right um so do you mean like the form like to learn how to deadlift or learn yeah, how to squat yeah technique and stuff like that but you know we're teaching that at to nine, 10 year olds and they're getting it, you know, technique wise. Um, then once we know they can do that, we can slowly start to build it yeah. and we can slowly start to build it nine, 10, 11, 12, 13. And then they're in the gym and they've been doing this stuff for years. Mm. So now it's like, well, they're ready to go. They're ready to start loading and start progressively building it. Um, and we call that training age. So you might have someone who's um, 13, who's been training, uh, you know, exposure to SNC for three years. Or you might have someone at 16, who's had zero years of exposure and their training age is zero of SNC. So, and it's, you can't, it's really, really tough to, to catch that time up because you can't cram it in. Yeah. You can't, you can't start doing five, Appreciate six sessions it. a week yeah. to, to, to catch up. So it really is important that we set that base early. Yeah. We drip feed progression um, and we start to ramp it up as and when that individual is ready. I find that really interesting because I get a lot of parents thinking, oh, no, he's not ready to start that. It's, or she is too early. Yeah, it's too early. And it's maybe that myth where, oh, no, we need to wait until they hit a certain age and then we'll focus on that. But hearing you go, if we get the foundation in early, then they're at a much better place. Yeah. Oh. But, but then I just want to um, really like pick up on when you say that the player does need to rest. Because you did mention that. You said, oh, they're going for a growth spurt or there's, there's some sort of reason where you won't ramp it up. Yeah, 100%. Rest, recovery, sleep, high quality nutrition, hydration, um, communicating with your coach. All fantastic things that you need to do and need to be consistent. And again, that, that's a joint up approach from all your surrounding bases, but in terms of when it's resting too much. and when backing off. too much? Oh, oh sorry, if, if just, um, sorry, I want to stick on this though. Um, yeah, like what are you specifically looking for, for a player going for a growth spurt or something, for growing? Where they need to stop. Where they need to stop. Okay. Yeah, sorry, that's what I'm looking for. Okay, cool, right. So when we monitor, and we, mon we monitor the height and weight more regularly than we test, if we notice they're going through a period of accelerate growth. Yeah. Okay. And if we just think of what that is, it's um, 
bones growing faster than connective tissue, ligaments, tendons, etc. Um, we've got, so we've got new limb length, we've got increased weight, we've got, and that, that then throws off kind of motor skills like coordination and things like that, proprioception. Um, uh, and then we would see something like, you hear comments like maybe, oh, he's lost the yard, or oh, the ball just went under his foot, like you'd normally Touch trap that. Him, yeah. um, so, and this is, if we look at it, this is completely, you know, acceptable and predictable and something you would expect to happen from someone who has now got legs that are slightly longer, hmm. body weight that's slightly heavier. Hmm. Um, center of gravity. Center of gravity has changed. Um, skills that I used to be able to do, I actually now have to think about and mm. I have to relearn that. And it's no, it's not different in kind of athletic development to kind of technical development. It's relearning the basics. Um, you know, we have to re-teach youngsters how to sprint and change direction after they've gone through this because it's a, yeah, a new body. Yeah. Um, so that's important in terms of when we need to back off though, and we we monitor this kind of growth. Um, when they go through that period, you know, heavier, you might be coming in later to tackles or challenges, and next if you've got more weight that you may be throwing around. But that lack of coordination, that period of time, we would say that's some increased risk of injuries happening. Um, and again, that might be a time where you go, we need to monitor their training load throughout the week. We need to monitor how much sleep they're getting, how they're feeling. Are they fatigued constantly? Um, are they getting enough food, rest and recovery in? We may need to back a, off a little bit on their training load, um, see how they respond and then go from there. Um, so that might be a, a, an indicator if they've had an accelerated period of growth, you go, we need to monitor what's happening here because if they are all of a sudden picking up little niggles and injuries on the same amount of training, you know, that might be a sign. Uh, and if left to just pass, that then potentially would lead to, may lead to something a bit more severe. And again, that's what you want to jump on nice and early. If we're monitoring throughout the year and having these conversations, yeah, it's something that we go, hold on, we've noticed that. And we speak to the technical coaches, oh, they've noticed that as well. Okay, as a joint up approach, what are we gonna do about it? We might need to back off on his training load a little bit. We may need to manipulate his training session um, to make sure that he's not overreaching. He's not constantly training in a state of fatigue. Um, That's a really great answer. Like, yeah, I've, I really understand that now and I, I hadn't before. Um, so so that's, that's excellent. And just see that, like how important having someone like this would be in your corner. Yeah, for sure. Uh, I mean, if, if that's what parents are going for and, you know, they're pushing their kid to, to be the best they can be at football. So why wouldn't you get the best or someone who's knowledgeable in this in this field, it's only going to help them. Yeah, to put it in maybe like a, a bit of an example as well, two kind of regular growth related injuries that we we'll see is uh, are like Osgoods uh, in the knee and yeah. Severs, Severs in, in, in the, the hill. hill. Yeah. yeah. So again, that's a sign that body's gone through a period of accelerated growth. The connective tissues, ligaments, tendons, um, you, you know, are experiencing some the pain receptors in that area, and they're giving feedback. This hurts. Um, so again, that's a sign of like, you know, the period's gone, the body's gone through that period. That's the consequence. It's preventing me from playing and training. That's the body's way of going, I need to back off a little bit. Mm. However, it is really tough when the demands on the player are, uh, well, well, that's too high. We get parents are, no, like, it might put the pressure on the kid to know you got to play through that or you got to carry on and but, but I, yeah cause I, I think that's a balance yeah. because on the other side you'll have maybe excuse making parents maybe like well go on Yuri I'm thinking more along the lines of biologically your predicted height might be six foot three six foot four yeah so you're gonna go through many periods of growth how do you manage um that okay we're in pain so yeah then back off but then actually this pair this player is going to go through many periods of growth through the season if you keep backing off the load um they're not going to get enough contact time they're not going to get enough hours just because they're growing so how do you get that balance really good question 
Um, we use, for example, say, let's, let's go with Osgood to the knee, right? So any kind of knee flexion is going to cause pain yeah. around the growth plate and, you know, prevent players from from training uh, from their normal volume, right? The normal yeah. training, training volume. Um, what we would want to do is try and maintain a level of strength. Um, the reason being, say that 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 period is easing off. Okay, what we want to do is keep a player nice and strong and robust, so that when that when that pain does start to ease off and they do start to ease back into training, they're not starting from zero again. What we've actually got is okay. We might have decreased contact time a little bit, but let's zoom out and look at this long term picture. Okay, they might have decreased for this period of time. Um, but what we've actually done is we've gotten back into football, yeah. pain free, nice and quickly. And we've gotten back in at strength levels, or trying to maintain strength levels as, as high as possible. So that transition back into football isn't one where, you know, I haven't been playing football, I'll go and play and I'll get another injury. Or I'll go back in and I'm not physically prepared enough for training. So I'll break down within the first two weeks of returning to play. So ways that we do that, we would, um, you know, use more strength exercises that aren't knee dominant um, and maybe focus more on the posterior chain, um, but would still allow that player to maintain strength level, global strength levels um, to then take back in when they do return to training, the pain does does ease off. But again, that can be different periods of time for different people. But, you know, we want a robust, strong athlete that isn't going to break down on return to training. Well, well that yeah, was a really good question, Yuri. Um, and that's what I was just going to ask of your question, what, what you were defining as like load, because like, can they still do like technical work while they're in this sort of period of pain, like even if it's dribbling between cones or? Yeah, more like, I suppose, what can they do? Um, so say, let's say, okay, it's Osgood. What can they do in that time to make sure they're maintaining strength or is there stuff that they can do alongside strength training to maintain a certain level or so their level doesn't drop so much so that, like you said, that uh, transition back into training is um, as easy as possible? I think because it's so individual, we try and maintain guidelines. So, you know, train as much as you can without within pain barriers. Um, you know, if it's, if, if you're not in pain, or if it's a little bit of pain, then eases after the warm up and you're feeling good, go for it. Um, if it's something that is extremely painful, um, is hurting consistently, and it's affecting your willingness to go to training or to to, to engage in high, in high intensity training as much as possible, then you might need to back off. But backing off isn't pulling completely away. It's how much can we still do within pain barriers that you know, you're still getting touched with the ball, you're still going to training, you're still engaging um, in your technical exercises and practices and stuff like that. You know, players of Oscars will, will, con will continue to train same as the other other guys. Yeah, I can uh, imagine oh. like it's quite hard for, Go let's say a, a player who is, you know, working hard to get their scholarship, but can't, doesn't have the match time mm. to, to be able to prove themselves or does that yeah. make sense because of what they're going through. 100%. So I can imagine it's quite hard to find that balance of letting them play to, but to that's, to that's that. where the club have to be good. Like and they, give them, yeah, but Ruben, Ruben, Loftus, Ruben Loftus Cheek, I remember them speaking about his journey and he went through so many growth spurts and um, they they had to work so closely with the strength and, strength and conditioning coaches at Chelsea um, to be really sensible about how they managed him through his years of puberty and his body changing because every time he'd get taller, yeah, he would then have to keep Adjusting. Um, yeah, adjusting. Mm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Relearning. Yeah. Um, but that that is a really good point, Marcelo. I mean, I'm thinking that what about with parents who kind of are saying that, oh, my kid's going through a growth spurt. That's why he's not playing well. That's why his technique's letting him down. Um, but maybe it's not a growth spurt. Maybe it's just they're not practicing enough and playing computer games too much. Yeah, I mean, we try and... Our, our main theme is to try and make sure these athletes are prepared. Because if you've got a good base and you're prepared enough, 
you're more likely to give the best account of yourself. You're more likely to execute and perform at your highest level consistently. Um, but, you know, you've got to want to, want to do those things. You've got to want to put the effort in, find out what you need to do, and then go and do it. The, you know, the, it's a lot of hard work to push your body to make adaptations and improvements. Your body just wants the easy, easy life, the easy road. So, you know, to put stress on your body, to train, to recover, to make sure these other elements that surround you are, are spot on. It, it does take, it does take effort. Mm. Um, and, you know, you got to stick to it. You got to be consistent. And there's no replacement for that. Um, but if someone is, does do that, you know, and gets all those, those surrounding bits spot on, they're going to be in a much stronger position to cope with training, to cope with playing, to recover better, um, to produce their stronger, more robust, they're less likely to break down. Um, you know, loads of research around stronger athletes getting injured less or less likely to get injured, sorry. Mm, um, that's part of the end goal, isn't it? To Let's say when they are professional, to be able to meet the demands, play 60 games a season without getting injured. Um, mm. And I think... For me, that's what I take a lot of a lot of what the strength and conditioning goal is. Some parents obviously might think it's just about the strength and and muscles and getting big muscles, but it's more for me. My my take home is being able to meet the demands to play the the, the amount of games they they do at a high absolutely. level. Absolutely, absolutely. I think one of our biggest um, aims as S and C coaches, and definitely at, at Advance, is if I can get this athlete. Um, to a position where they're strong, robust enough to meet the demands of the sport, they're less likely to get injured, more uh, more likely to recover well, and play consistently at the highest level they can. That's aim number one. Yeah, you know things like performance enhancement. Um, yes, it's you know something that people see and would want maybe first. However, that's a result of being really consistent, um, being stronger, being able to produce more force into the floor. Um, to do things like break faster, change direction quicker, um, accelerate more efficiently, jump higher. Um, they're all the things that you go, oh yeah, they're the bits that I want. Um, however, our main aim is kind of go, if we can keep you injury free mm. as a fantastic talent, that's got to be aim number one. Uh, you, pff, injury free or reduce the likelihood of injury. Sport is random, football's random. You're going to be thrown yeah, into yeah, all different yeah. positions. Injuries will happen. Yeah. However... If we've got an athlete that is strong um, in relation to their body weight, so we call that relative strength, if they've got the nutrition, they're eating, eating high, highly nutritious foods, the hydration's on point, they're sleeping regularly, they're feeding back to their coach, um, you know, I would be in a much happier position knowing that, that that athlete's done that. I would say mm, they're probably more likely to perform at a higher level and, you know, then go on to achieve their potential just going back to where we were talking about the players who are going through different like growth spurts and then how you react to that um i wanted to ask about the relationship with parents with if the if the kid is yeah not performing well um do you think it's it's very important that the parent club and child um are having a very sort of like open, like candid communication style um, where, like you say, if the child is in that severe pain, they're able to like speak up. It's not that they're saying, oh, I'm, I don't want to speak to the coach because I might lose my place in the team. Um, or they're like, oh, I don't want to tell my dad I'm injured because he's going to have a go at me. He's going to think I'm weak. But then on the flip side of it, you've got other kids who love being in the physio room maybe they lack attention from somewhere and then they want attention. So like, yeah, how do, what education goes into that? I think, like you said, um, building relationships, being honest um, and being being frank with everyone. Yeah. Um, having a joint up approach okay. where the player is at the, is at the center and they feel that all of these people are pushing in the same direction for them. Um, and it's an atmosphere where you can share things. Um, and, you know, these boys are intelligent. 
uh, not boys, sorry, these, these athletes, these players are intelligent because we work, we work a lot with females as well. Yeah. I'm sure we'll probably touch on that a little bit, but you know, they're intelligent athletes. Um, they're mature. So if you are honest and open and you set that out from the, from the start, and that's a precedent that you, that you maintain, they know that you've got their best interests at heart um, and are more likely to then go, oh, they are, money's already hurting. Um, I'm, not gonna, I'm not scared of sharing that information because I know that my SNC coach, my coach are all fighting with my parents, are all pushing in the same direction and they told me not to, you know, not to persist through excruciating pain, mm. that this is a period that we're gonna help you manage as a collective together and we're gonna get through it, um, you know, and we're gonna help prepare you for when that happens. Um, but I think like like you said, honest, you know, candid conversations, yeah. um, letting the athlete know that we're all working with you together, you're not on your own with this and, and maybe backing off, you, you train a little bit. Um, I know it doesn't seem like it now, but it might be the best in the long run, just to keep you healthy. Yeah. Because yeah. if we push through this, then we, we further aggravate injury it's going to prolong the period that you're not back able to play um, or get back to training or wherever it may be. So yeah. as early as those conversations can happen. Um, and again, it's just creating that atmosphere, um, I think really helps. And the athlete feels like, oh, buzzing, you know, people are on my side, yeah. understand. And if I'm hurting, I, I can tell them, I can share that information without feeling like, oh, you know, I'm going to let someone down or like, you know, I'm not training, I can't go to training this week. I let my parents down or whatever. But, but not going so far on the other side that they become like Darren Anderton and just forever in the physio room. Well, this is, <clears throat> this is, the, this is the thing we try and we'd say if, you know, if we've got a stronger, robust athlete that's had these years of practice and they've been building it up and drip feeding it slowly, yeah. hopefully they get to a position where, you know, they've had so much experience, their training age is so high. It won't come to that. Their relative strength levels are so high in comparison to their body weight. They can perform lots of different moves. You know, we would like to think the likelihood of that is less. So, you know, you can have more athletes playing uh, and less, like you said, in the in the physio room for... for do, do you ever see kids fake injury? Um... I'm gonna say no. I haven't. I haven't. No, I haven't seen that. Um, you know, when I was playing, you might see your mate. Oh, I'm like, you're not injured. Come on, <laughs> yeah. whatever. But yeah, I, I think that's more where we're going with it. It's more you do get maybe in like training sessions where you've coached a team and you can see the sessions just got a bit intense and a player maybe doesn't isn't quite managing to, to, to maintain that level of intensity or you've got a small group session where you're pushing players quite hard um, physically, but also technically and, you know, their brains are working and it's, yeah, and the player's like, oh, yeah, I'm, I need a break or yeah, I'm hurt. Or when you're looking at them, you're like, yeah, you could probably keep going. Like, do you not really get that at, in s &C sessions and stuff? Or do you think? Um, I think it's different for different groups. Different backgrounds have shaped different characteristics. I would say that, um, you know, at, at the top level, they know where they want to be. So the drive to continue, um, even if having a bad session, you know, you know, they they are still youngsters at the end of the day, depending on, on what age we're talking here, um, and they're going to face those battles emotionally, you know, with different motivations and. Um, uh, and, and pushing hard to where they want to be. But, you know, a lot of them are, are driven, self-driven. And it's the ones where you turn around, they're doing stuff that you told them to do three weeks ago and they're doing it off their own back. And you'll go, okay, that's impressive. Mm. That's good. Or they're coming to you and going, Harry, I want to improve this bit of my strength, uh, you know, or, or I wasn't pleased with this bit of my testing uh, and I really want to improve it. Is there anything I can do? You can, can you help me? Yeah, hundred percent. And you know, I'm I'm more than happy, more likely to go out of my way to go right. Let's let's put this in place. Let's do this um, as your pre-arrival activity, or mm. let's you know, I'll take some time before training and let's do this. Or when you're doing your workouts and when you're in the gym with me, let's make sure we're really moving with intent. Let's make sure and just making those minor adjustments. 
um, to try and to try and push them. But it's the ones that you know do it off their own back uh, and are self-driven. Um, you know, with encouragement, because sometimes you have to be a role model and go, you know, this is how it's done. You have to push hard. Do you see that? Do that again. That's how you need to do that. But with those stories of Ronaldo, where they had to actually lock the gym at Sporting Lisbon, like, is there too much? Um, sometimes, but rarely. Really? Um, yeah, I would say. As long as they're getting enough sleep. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there are some times where we have to go, right, you've come in, you told me you're tired, okay? We've reflected on what you've done currently so far this week and last week. Yeah. Your training volume is quite high. Let's back off a little bit this week. Or maybe, you know, decrease your training session, This the volume of this training session. Right? Instead of five exercises, just, just do two. Do some recovery. Get yourself home. Get some sleep, nutrition, hydration, etc. But... Yeah, I think if we're looking at their, their training load, how much work they're getting through, it's tough. If anything, we I'd like to have them more. Uh, and we, we, you know, at the lab, it's, you know, we've seen really good improvements with people training a certain time, amount. Um, and this is where we've seen the most optimal and most efficient or depending on age, age groups and stuff yeah. like that. But, you know, I think it's building. There's definitely a change in the tire, there's a shift where people are going, hold on, I know I need, I know I've seen that. I now know what it is. I just need to know how do I go about getting it a bit more? Where do I fit it in, in my, in my week? Um, and obviously at Chelsea, that's, that's structured for them. Um, but outside of that grassroots, you know, teams um, in between, um, you know, how often do I do it? Where do I get that? And that's, that's you know, where we come in with the, the education piece, whether it be with us or not. Um, we just want to allow people to to know where to access it, how to access it and who to, who to kind of go to. Um, but yeah. Marcelo, have you ever had a parent who's l like come to you and said, we got released from our club and then the pe the excuse kind of the parent made and it might be justified but they said my child was going through a growth spurt and the club didn't really support with that and then um i've had sorry i've had parents say yeah my my child is going through a bad phase of form um his feet aren't quite moving the same as before um maybe you know they used to be quite skillful and right now they're a bit, bit more clumsy with with their footwork um and yeah it, it it's maybe led to a release but i don't think that will be the the only the only reason why they got released in my opinion yeah but that makes sense yeah so that's maybe what we think in our minds when we hear it where we we would say well maybe there's another side to this not to say they're wrong but yeah. just i'm not going to take what you're saying completely at face value yeah um, but yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm interested. Maybe, maybe it was a club that didn't handle it well enough or didn't, didn't, um, give the play. Yeah. Cause it's like, it's so hard to know how, which players do you gamble on? Which players do you say, oh yeah, this, this changes that are happening through puberty. Um, we need to give that much time and this is why it's affecting their football and, yeah. um, it's like, or, or it's like, no, they are becoming a very different player than we signed that under nine. And we're, we're, we're not seeing that this person is gonna go and be a first team footballer. Yeah, I would definitely agree in terms of when players go through maturation, styles change, the body changes, uh, their, you know, what they're exposed to and the experience in of the game and, and of training can change. Um, I think what's, fantastic at, at Chelsea and, and with other clubs um, and our job as S&C coaches is that um, the level of communication and detail um, it would never you know come down to to one thing I think it's all informing each other um, of kind of like we said earlier of here's their testing stats here's their level of maturation they've gone through a, a, um, a period, of, period of accelerated growth here's what we're expecting to see after that just for a heads up. Oh yeah, we've seen some of that in uh, training and in games a little bit. 
Um, let's speak to the physio, are they getting any growth related injuries? So, you know, being able to draw on many different sources gives really good context. Yeah. yeah. Um, and then after that, a decision, uh, you know, scouts, uh, senior coaches and, and stuff are able to make a decision. But I think our job is to provide that foundation of information that wraps around the footballer for and and then decisions after that are are is there is there a ceiling to a player's strength and conditioning that's what relative I was strength ask. and conditioning and also if they start earlier does that ceiling get reached quicker or can that be pushed G great question because i think it's one of the most important factors that we look at with um an athlete is their relative strength so how strong are you in relation to your body weight? Okay, so we get obviously like smaller players, taller players, uh, more with more muscle mass, less, et cetera, as depending on their stage of development, especially with female athletes, when they go through maturation, changes in body composition, um, you know, and like body fat percentage, that will definitely alter their relative strength levels. So for example, um, again, if we zoom out and look at the long-term plan, we would say like gold standards, um, of relative strength between like 1.5 and two times your body weight in uh, in a variety of different lifts. Two times your body weight. If you say that to a 10 year old or if you say that to a parent of a 10 year old, they're like, what? But with the education and context, that's the end goal. And we do it by laying the foundations of play, building, drip feeding, slowly progressing. And by the time they're kind of like 13, 14, they might already be to one times their body weight, be able to maybe, for example, back squat one times their body weight because they've been practicing, their training age is so high, they've been practicing for years. That's perfectly acceptable for them. Whereas you, someone who, who has no idea on it might go, well, they've got their body weight on their back and they're, they're squatting, yeah. Um, and then from there, as they go through maturation, they come out the other side, release of hormones, testosterone, et cetera, then you can really, you know, step on it and, push that so they get to that point yeah so they're, uh, they're they're consistently trying to build towards that you know 1.5 to 2 times body weight um and again when you get there you've got a strong robust athlete who can produce a large amount of force in a short amount of time high ground reaction forces and high rate of force development um and they're going to be explosive and they're going to have to do those kind of things when really well when trialists come in, let's say under 13, under 14, are they way off it physically? It's a really good question because what you might have is you might have a team with, you know, years of training experience, yeah. exposure to athletic development, yeah. strength and conditioning, loads of skill-based practice, loads of exposure to regular sprinting and jumping and bounding, plyometrics, et cetera. Yeah. And then you might have someone from grassroots no formal coaching, no formal exposure to, to any s &C. So it is really tough. You're, so you, we speak to coaches and stuff and they're looking at obviously their technical ability, but for me, from, from the physical point, it's really tough to gauge because they've had no formal coaching. So we're trying to start from zero and we're trying to build that training age. And like we said, it's really tough the older you get to catch up on those years. Um, so the earlier we can do it, the better. But yeah, sometimes there is a really big gap um, with their athletic development and, phys and from a physical standpoint. Sometimes they cut, they get up to speed. Yeah. Sometimes not. Um, the environment um, that you create um, exposes them to lots of different things. When they're that, when they are still young, they are picking it up really quickly they will absorb all that information and you know and, and skill-based learning um but when with these players that are like well off it because a scout might be out there on a sunday see a player who looks powerful looks fast like he would uh, be ticking in um the boxes to say this pl this player is great physically i'm scoring like nines or something and then they then come in you then start working with them but their technique on a lunge or their technique off a squat is so bad, um, you're like, oh, this is this is hard work. Um, but can you also identify that there is power there and there is there is strength? 
yeah, like, raw. I th- yeah. I th- I, firstly, I think if I'd, if I had no exposure to to kind of strength moves, lunge, squat, uh, hinge, etc. Yeah. yeah, it's a skill. It's a skill that can be learned, um, and like any kind of skill with enough practice, they will eventually start performing that autonomously without thinking. And that's when you then start to increase the level of challenge and load and et cetera. So it can be learned. Um, the benefits of learning it earlier are, are what we've spoken about. In terms of the power, we do kind of, that's where our kind of test regular testing comes in. So what we might see is we might see um, a deficiency of skill development. However, what we might see through testing is, you know, when we put them through a jump or we ask them to sprint, we're looking at times and we're contrasting that with previous years. We're contrasting that with the current age group, um, squad averages, where, th- where they sit. We then start, again, start to build that picture of, okay, right, skill development's down. That's to be expected. Hasn't had any formal coaching. We can teach that. If he's willing to learn and put the work in, we can teach that. Um, but if we look at stats, speed, acceleration over 10 meters, speed over 30, um, counter movement jump, um, some change of direction bits, it's not far off. We can see, you might you might say, oh, actually, you know, speed is actually quite up there. He's in the top third of the group. That's really good. And he's given us signs that that can continue to improve. Um, you know, hasn't had much exposure to any jumping any power modalities or training. So his jump's not not great, but we can see some some really good signs there. Um, his change of direction is quite good. So, you know, and, we, and then we, we're taking that to the coaches and building that picture around the, the try list, going, okay, there's, there's, some, there's some bits that are maybe not there at the moment, but we can teach, but there's also some really good signs that they're... they're so for, for our listeners, typically how long is a trial? At an academy, um, it's a minimum of eight weeks. Minimum of eight weeks. That's the EPP law now. Cool. Says that you have to have eight weeks. So minimum. in that period, is there enough period to go? All right, let, this is what they were when they started off with, uh, when they first come in, and then eight weeks later, actually, that player's made a huge improvement, and it's now translating onto the pitch. I think it would be tough to say. In eight weeks, I want this trialist to be competing with other members of the squad uh, from a physical standpoint. It's really tough to say that. What I think would be nice to say is, here's his baseline when we tested him when first away when he come in. What have we seen since then? What are the, uh, the original signs when he first tested that we go, oh, actually, you know, 30 meter speed was quite good um, and change of direction was quite good, but we maybe need to work on other areas. Um, and that, are they are they coachable? Are they willing? Are they willing to learn? Yeah. Are they willing to put the work in? Do they understand that it's a process? It's not going to happen straight away. Not to get um, disheartened by that, but instead for that to fuel them and go, all right, cool. You know, I've been given some some good feedback and some areas to work on, and and they've told me how they're going to help me, which is fantastic. And in sessions, I'm going to work on that. So the stuff that I've been given or identified as maybe not there just quite yet. That's the bit I'm really going to work on in session when I'm being given exercises, when we're in the gym, when we are on pitch and we are sprinting, I'm going to make sure that I'm listening. I'm, mm. I'm trying to get as most uh, as much out of it as possible um, to try and catch up that gap. So with what I do with Chelsea, it's really focused with the under sevens, under eights, like the real, real like young ones. <clears throat> so... I'm not that familiar with the decision-making process of signing a new trialist with like the old, like under 13s, under 14s. Um, but I'm, I'm really, really interested to f- wonder like how much like the people that sign off and make the final decisions on a signing. Um, and again, I always like to say, this is not just Chelsea, this is like all other clubs as well. But it's like, this, this sounds so important. Like, a player like are they able to be coachable are they able to learn well and not just learn well from football techniques and football IQ but also can we teach them strength work like if if they literally are trying to teach them that technique off a, off a squat and <laughs> I know because like my trainer like has a hard time with me teaching it it's hard um so then yeah like like if if you're really like banging your head 
are you feeding that back? You, you say you feed that back to your coaches who might be like the under 13 lead. But I wonder if the top people who make the decision on a trial list, if that ends up feeding back to them, that the player is maybe not as coachable learning, you know, like physical development. Um, again, not for certain, but I would say that because there are many different people and many different avenues of information, um, I would say that that person's character, ability to learn, willingness to learn, um, previous experience, mannerisms, that kind of stuff, it all adds to the picture. Right. Um, and then it, it's a matter of, you know, how much weight is put behind each of those different bits. Mm. Um, but, you know, different loads of different information from different angles is just going to give context to the picture um, and provide a better understanding of, of that athlete that's in the middle. Um, and then obviously a, a decision's got to be made. Um, I, think it's, I think it's really important, even if it's an, because we do get some uh, athletes or some footballers that perhaps don't necessarily like that side of, of the game. Yeah. Um, but it, I think it's a really telling point where even though they don't like it, they know the importance of it and they're still willing to go through it. And it yeah. tells them a lot about their character. And I think it's going to happen in games when you're going to have to do something you don't like, where you have to yeah. defend or 100%. whatnot. So in it all translates. Yeah. I think, again, I think this, this is where the, the, there's, been, there's becoming a shift where players understand that I have to work on this physical piece. You know, everyone else is doing it. I can't afford not to. And I understand why it's so important. Yeah. Um, and I understand why it's a regular fixture in my training week now. Mm. Um, but I would also, also say like, you know, there's no, there's no reason why it can't be fun. There's no reason that it can't be challenging and motivating because, you know, youngsters, that's what youngsters love. And, you know, for example, when they come into the lab, we are playing all these different games. It's really challenging. We make it really, we make it tough for them. Yeah. Like, okay, well, you can't do it. It's I've seen some of the sessions you, you guys put on at Chelsea and it's great atmosphere. The music's playing, everyone's, mm. you know, working hard, but it just seems like a, a good atmosphere. I, I'll go. I've got a question. So, um, it's, so we had a bit of a debate about this and it's something that comes up quite often about sort of athletes in football. Um, and you get players that perhaps play certain positions where the requirements of them aren't as, I'd say, explosive or, you know, that a lot of what they do is generated from football IQ and, and movement off the ball and that kind of thing. How much s &C would a player like that need to do to make sure that they can cope with the demands of, 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 of football at that level? And then also, um, how, how much do you read into, say, if their scores are lower than some of the really, really explosive players in the group. Mm. Does that make sense? Yeah, I think, are we talking about elite players here? Or are we talking about developing players that have got characteristics yeah, similar to that? Okay, I was gonna say, because if we're talking about elite players. I'm sure they are, <laughs> I'm yeah, not yeah, 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 <laughs> yeah, yeah, No, I'm talking like, so yeah, so let's say we bring in a a, a, a player or, yeah, you know, yeah. been out scouting and we've identified a player who, um, it's perhaps not like the typical player you'd bring in who yeah. you know physically is going to be able to cope with the demands of training three times a week at that intensity at that level and is going to work with someone like you or has had a bit of background in, mm. in s and and is going to be, like you said, maybe doesn't lack some fundamentals, but or perhaps has been at another club, has been released and now has come into a different yeah. environment. Yeah, um, yeah. How, how do you approach those types of players who maybe don't have that background and, and maybe they're being brought in for characteristics other than their physical, if that makes sense. Yeah, I think firstly, it's quite interesting, like, you know, with, with senior players and stuff like that, we, we just briefly touched on that, you know, I've won championships, I've won titles without SNC. So why do I need to do that? And I, I suppose that's a, that's a completely different-, different Did someone question. say that to you? No, but no, I think, it would be tough to then say to someone who's an established senior player, um, you, you, you've now got to start doing this. Yeah. Uh, I I you can imagine, you think about like Perlo or, or any kind of senior player in generations gone by, um, 
but obviously the game's evolving and it's changing and you know the speed and of the they game's would have improved. had to do some sort of to, it, again stay injury free exactly be able to play exactly. 50 60 games exactly. in a season i bet moderich has done loads yeah i mean it, it it's really it's really tough different cultures different things if we take we read a book called the athletic skills model and it gives a take on it's, it touched on your question that from Zenden, who used to play for obviously yeah. Chelsea, yep. um, smaller player, got into football late, um, but did a hell of a lot of judo. Mm -hmm. So if we're looking at previous experiences, the foundation, he was really comfortable being in body contact, um, you know, making contact with the opposition and still able to, to execute different skills. And that just adds to your um, repertoire of techniques skills that you can use tactics that you use in your game to make you the style of player that you are yeah um if you are a player that maybe isn't you know naturally athletic athletically gifted or hasn't had any formal formal training um you as an snc coach we want to push as Maximize much as we can the, their potential um, to, their yeah team. exactly to, to increase their ceiling to push their ceiling higher to allow them space to, to move into it and if they, if we can push them and improve them physically, that's going to allow them to execute their style of play better on the pitch, whatever that style is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that makes so much sense. Yes, um, I think it's really important to to know that you know there are different styles. Um, all we're trying to do is allow you to reach your athletic potential. Yeah, to go and play and execute your style your bit. style yeah. exactly yeah do you think that there is a risk that some parents who are listening to this today and they've got maybe six-year-old seven-year-old eight-year-old children they're gonna be like okay man we need to go and get this kid weightlifting we need to do all this yeah and then uh they spend less time doing ball work um i would say like we spoke about, you, you probably gather by now it's kind of a cornerstone for me that it's a long-term athletic development plan and it's it's a consistent drip feeding of these uh, different elements that shift and interchange and change through maturation. Um, in terms of the balance, it's really tough because recently what we've seen at Advance is you know, people come to us go, oh, we know we want to do some s &C. Yeah. I know how important it is. Yeah. So, I've, I've done my research and, and, and we've come to you and we want some help. And I'm like, okay, right, cool. When can you train? Oh, well, we've got football Monday and this on Tuesday and that on Wednesday. And he does this three times on Thursday and Friday and Saturday. I'm okay. That's brilliant. As we've already established, we want you guys to play. We know it's your sport and your passion. We want you to play as much as possible and train as much as possible. But we want you to be able to cope with the demands of that sport without breaking down. So, you know, that physical corner, we want to be the foundation for all of your training. And if at the moment you're breaking down, if at the moment you're getting overuse, fatigue injuries with your current training schedule, you might need to adapt that. Um, and there is going to be a, a trade-off, like anything, there's, there's, there's a trade-off. If I might need to sacrifice, you know, if I'm training seven, you know, people come to us, we train seven times a week, eight times a week, whatever it may be. You know, we want you to play football, but we want you to excel in it and, you know, and really push yourself. And if backing off a technical session to have uh, a physical session and start building that foundation, we have seen that, you know, they are improving their confidence in their physical capabilities, expressing themselves physically on the pitch, a level of confidence to them impose themselves on the game in a way that I didn't think I could do that. Because I'm small, because I'm not strong, I, I do get, off, uh, you know, mm -hmm. eased off the ball maybe. And then after a, a period of time of training, they're going into games going, or we've had feedback from parents and stuff going, you know, he's still small compared to the other boys, but his level of confidence and intent and uh, and aggression in his, yeah. his physical play, yeah. And his attitude towards it now has shifted because he knows he's working on an element that he hasn't previously. Yeah. Or an element that other people aren't doing. Mm. Um, so it's, it, you know, physical adaptations are slow. However, you may see something like a shift in confidence or a change in character 
that might be the initial change that you do see because they know oh, actually I'm, I'm putting the work in away from football I'm doing this thing that that everyone else is doing at elite clubs like I hope that parents listening to this and I'm sure they will will if they didn't know beforehand they're like realizing like how important this is and um if they want their kids to be pro footballers then they need to make the time they need to find an extra day in the week like there needs to be something they give up i mean i don't think it's that important to learn how to swim no i think i think yeah. <laughs> you could once you've learned to swim like you're not going to die then that's enough i think i think harry mentioned it earlier i think it's important for them to be exposed to different movement patterns and different things so like like with Zenden's case where he did a lot of judo, so martial arts, swimming. Yeah. Um, I think it is important to to do stuff like that at the younger ages, especially because that is part of your exposure, isn't it? As you sort of said. But a well, conversation I was having with Matt Healy the other day was he, he was having someone who wanted to come and do a gen football session, right. but then the parent was saying, yeah, but with their team, I don't know which team it was, but they train twice a week, I think. Okay. So there's two team sessions a week and then they played their match on the Sunday. Right. And then the parents said, that's all we can afford. I don't know if it was afford to do, but I think it was like they had time to do because they, they have homework and they have yeah. other children or whatever other commitments. So it was like two team sessions and then the match. And so then Matt was like, mm, all right, but maybe maybe don't go to the team session. Like why do, if that's all your resources, if that's all you've got time to do, how beneficial is doing two team sessions a week for your kid, really? My argument would be, you can't want, you could, they're gonna improve in that context for the level that they're playing, but if you want your child to excel and be as good as they can be, they need more contact time. They need, so they need to look at how they make more time because if they get an academy trial, straight away they're gonna be playing four times a week rather than three. Yeah. So they're gonna have to make the time anyway. And if, you go to definitely Fulham, definitely Chelsea, and we say, oh yeah, no, he can't come training because he swims that day. Chelsea oh, they're not gonna like, say yeah. that, no, no. But you not. know what I'm saying, right? But it's so. like, how do you catch up? And then I'm learning from speaking to Harry, is that you have to, if I, if I had a kid, I'd be saying, I'd wanna be booking in some consultancy with you at, at least, I'd like I'd want the kid visiting you like once a month like like one, once a month that he's just in your contact time so you to be able to observe and then give me some feedback mm. but then i'd also if but depending on the age i think i've learned that i think like judo would be an important thing and i've always had that idea before and then it would then like you've talked about growing and, and if the kid ended up going to an academy then yeah you can put the trust in the academy but assuming they're not in an academy then how do you make up the academy experience with your own resources in grassroots mm. so then it's like well, the kid is now getting to like nine years old. We're gonna find one day a week. I'd say I'd say come to you four times a week. Would you? For, sorry, four times four times a month. <laughs> four times a month. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. Once a week. Yeah. Is so that what what we've seen is we have different uh, subscriptions and models and stuff where it's flexible. We understand that there's a lot there's lots going on throughout the week, like we've just kind of explained. And what we want to do is go whatever level you can commit to we want to be able to make that accessible for you. So for example, we get parents and they can train once a month. Um, again, with testing, with all the, the clothing and stuff like that, we've got a purpose-built app that we give them with all their testing results on, with all their workouts on, videos and wow. feedback and blogs Amazing. and stuff like awesome. this. Well so, you know, the package is is really good because it's new. We know that, you know, people need educating and we need to show them why it's beneficial, but the package is fantastic. And we say to people, you know, if you come once a month, oh, sorry, <laughs> if you come once a week, four yeah. times a month, yeah, you know, and you're consistent, if that's all you can do, but you're consistent with it. Oh, so you'd want more than once a week? Um, Let me put a scenario then. So uh, let's say my boy yeah. is now, he's turned, because you start at seven, right? He's seven years old. What would you, recommend what i would say and what we say with all parents is if you can commit to once a week absolutely fantastic okay because it's once a week more than you were previously doing and he's been going to be exposed to something he's never been exposed to before potentially um and the likelihood of seeing results is quite high because they've gone from nothing to something um 
then it's become, it comes down to a lots of different factors in how I can increase my training volume to potentially like twice a week. Um, but it, it happens, there's kids that absolutely love it. And they go, oh, actually, I, I, do, I do want to go to the lab and train. I do want to do that. those youth s and at seven, so even at seven, twice a week. But even, okay. But, it, it, but it, again, it, to it, it totally depends on the family, other commitments, um, you know, siblings. Let's, let's talk like. utopia though. Okay, like, cool, talk, yeah. right. What, if, I, if I can have you for two sessions a week throughout the season, I'm pretty confident that we can. I can get you to a, 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 a stage where you're in, improving way more than when you were initially. But okay, but, but remember, there, though, okay. Sorry, go on. But then, if the parent suddenly starts prioritizing, they've got seven days a week. Uh, you know, the seven like the five evenings in the week. Yeah, and maybe two of them are going to be with you. So now they've only got three evenings for football sessions. Yeah. That that could end up, you know, the type of footballer that we want to, that you know, is a top player is going to have great technique, and then maybe they miss out on technical work. Yeah, but you look you look for great movers and maybe powerful athletes, so maybe they're getting that. I think maybe it, they're no, developing no, that. No, no, no. What? What? Say that again? <laughs> Just so, throw that statement at me. <laughs> no, Modric so, is one of my favourite players. Okay, but when you're recruiting at a young age, predominantly, or what? What one of the, what's one of the things you might look for? A good mover, powerful, or whatnot, right? So maybe they're getting they're going to Harry yeah. twice a week. Yeah, but then that. yeah, but then if the player is like super powerful, but they can't touch the ball and they make really you know bad decisions. No, we don't want just the powerful player. I think not just. I think the the most balanced and and sensible way of looking at it is you look at it player for player by player. I think one thing that's really stuck with me that you used to talk about is how long the journey is and that it's athlete development. So even though you're making a footballer or you're making a runner or a boss, whatever sport you're working in, it's athlete development. Yeah. So you've got to develop all parts of that athlete. So if there are times when you have to prioritize perhaps more ball time and developing that, then that is more appropriate. Yeah. But then I think there are also gonna be times where as the player gets older, as they're going through different levels of physical mat maturation, yeah. I think it's important to also, even if you can't get over to the lab once a, more than once a week, you're using these types of resources to do things at home. Cause I'm sure I don't want to make assumptions of what kind of parent you're going to be, but <laughs> there's going to be some some physical workouts at home that they'll do some regular stuff. So like press ups or what, and, and, and maybe this is my question is if players can only have limited access to get into you once a week, can they still benefit from have it simply because of time constraints like Sean's explained. Yeah. If, if they've got a busy schedule, they've got more than one child or it's too difficult to get over mm -hmm. twice a week. What can they do to support that long-term athlete development? Good question. I think on the first point, there are no hard and fast rules. It is different for each family and each athlete. It, the more the more you can train SNC, the more you can be exposed to these different sports, different environments, and build that skill base, the better. You know, we've got some athletes that can't get in at all, and they just train with us via the app. But they can they they they, they can just get one strength session a week. But they do that one strength strength session every single week, and they're so consistent with it. And for me, I'm happy with that because I'm going. They're guaranteeing me that every single week, so that we can maintain physical uh, outputs. And I know they're going to maintain a level of preparedness to then go into their sport. Um, two times a week, one times a week, one time a week. Some kids just love it. Some kids just love coming in, playing tug of war, getting on the monkey bars, learning how to squat and lunge and push a heavy sled and play dodgeball and do all these different guys. They love it so much. It's fun for them. So it's easy for them to go, oh, I want to come again. However, other athletes where it's like, they know they have to do it um, and they can only do come once a week. Or sometimes they go, oh, there's a period of, I've got two months now where or a month or so where I've got games and I'm going. To, I'm out of the country and I'm playing this tournament and I'm not going to be able to come for six, seven weeks, wherever mm, it may be. Mm. And I'm like, okay, but we've, we've been building and preparing for this moment. 
we're at a certain strength level. You, you, you know what you need to do. There's certain things I can give you away from uh, our training. And we've prepared you physically to be at a stage where if you do need to go out of the country and, and, and compete or whatever it may be, we're happy that you're at a certain level that you can go and do that. Um, so we've prepared you correctly to then go and perform. In terms of your question of on, on press ups and stuff. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, it's, again, depending on, on, on age groups, if you're doing you know, some extra things at home, some press ups, some sprints, um, uh, you know, whatever it may be, I, I don't see any reason that that is going to cause any harm. Um, you know, if anything, the fact that you're going, I oh, know I've got to do something, or, or, or I know I need to do some some extra bits to work on my physicality, yeah. and you're actually going out of your way as a, as, a, as a young player to then go and do that off your own back at home, it's fantastic for me. Then you're more likely to ask questions like, oh, I've been doing this, what do you think? Or can you give me some advice on? And then that's my opportunity to go, brilliant that you're doing stuff. Fantastic that you're doing stuff off your own back. How about we sprinkle in some sprints and how about we sprinkle in some some jumps and bounds and plyometrics to do with your locomotion? How about we sprinkle in some change of direction um, to, 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 to lay a, a nice broad base? But mm -hmm. the fact they're doing stuff off their own back um, at home on their own or whatever it may be with with siblings is is fantastic and it just tells me a bit more about the person rather than what they're actually doing it, you know it tells me that they're driven and good mindset yeah yeah so the fact that they're doing some some press ups and stuff that like that was cool. the um well, episode with Khalil which one of the first ones that we did where his his boy Perry's boy Khalil is doing really well with Chelsea and he said on the episode that he gets him to do like burpees and press ups every night before he goes to sleep. Um, and it's like a routine they have every day. And there's a few players who are doing well that I know at different academies. And that is a routine that they also have. Um, I want to go back to, you see how England and England's footballers that we've been producing in recent years, they seem to be like more technical and seem to be like able to make better, quicker decisions. And we're competing much better with other European nations that we didn't use to in the past. Why are you smiling? <laughs> What's so funny? Well, well, yeah. no, no. <laughs> <laughs> um, in the past, we didn't produce players like that. Um, we had, uh, and, and people put it down to scouts, scouting just the athlete, effective player first. And there was a lot around that win at youth level. And maybe a lot of our training was like physical, um, whatever that would be, not so much ball work. We had very fit, physical players, um, yeah, how is that balanced? I mean, I know, to be fair, you kind of like explained it throughout the whole episode, <laughs> but but hearing you refer to say two times a week um, for, for a physical session and, and having that as a priority, m my fear is that some parents might hear that and then we go back to a old way of, of thinking maybe or old priority. No, I, I, I hear you, I hear you. And I think two times a week for, you know, is a small majority, my, my, yeah, a majority of people, families that can access and actually make it two times a week. You know, it's a, out of the hundreds of athletes that come through the lab every week, I would say there's a small percentage of that, that train twice a week. So let's just, I think. And I think, and there. to be fair, I think I'm thinking of like under 12 down. Okay, okay, under tw that's good to frame. Un yeah, sorry, I should have framed that because under 12 down is where the brain is more REM sleep and there's more like, like they call it like golden years of learning and there's more like muscle memory. So we can, yeah, teach skill a lot. You know, we've got that window of opportunity to teach skill. Yeah. Whereas after 12, maybe we lose that. Um, so that's why I'm saying, yeah, for those ages, I would think a priority on ball work is important. So. Yeah, I think I, that's a really good point. Um, in the younger ages, it's a lot of exposure to kind of unstructured play and letting the environment dictate the adaptation. Um, so 100% agree with that. Um, and then as they get older, yeah. as they're able to, um, deal with more structured training, then potentially there may be a shift in emphasis. Um, again, 
the level of level of coordination needed, uh, level of skill development needed is so high. Um, and that's where we want them to be. We want them to be able to execute uh, at the highest levels. So they would need training and exposure to, you know, high intensities, high volumes of those technical proficiencies. Yeah. So they need yeah. to, they need to go and be technically proficient. Okay. Um, it's, it's just how we balance that with their laying the foundations of their physical development. And I don't see why it can't be a, a joint up approach. You know? Yeah. If like, we're, we're exposing them to like all these multi-movement, multi-tag games, hand-eye coordination, climbing up walls, monkey bars, tug of war, these bits, and then let's get into some technical work. You know, there's there's no reason that those two environments have to be- uh, uh, Also at your at your lab, you might get a ball out and you might do some technical work. Um, No, <laughs> Okay. no, just because, you know, we look at what are you getting lots of currently what are you not getting a lot of currently? And we're gonna work on filling those buckets of the bits you're not working currently. So, you know, for example, if you're doing lots of technical work in your, your week, when you come to us, we're gonna fill the bucket that you're not getting off. So maybe you're not sprinting over long distances. Maybe you're not uh, doing loads of jumping and bounding. Maybe you're not climbing. Maybe you're not grappling with, with players enough maybe you're not yeah so wrestling and doing parkour and learning to control your body weight and learning about uh, different strength exercises so yeah. that's that's the bucket we choose to fill up nice one very interesting um i think one thing that, that i've picked up on i think it's important to, to say it as well is that it's very what the work that you guys are doing and what snc looks like at a younger age groups just sounds very um multifaceted if that makes sense so like Completely. it's a mixture of you're not just working on um yeah loads and and lifts and and that kind of thing it is a lot of m different types of movement and taking children through different planes of movements yeah. that's developing the all-round athlete yeah. um and because of that i think there's a lot transferable in what they're doing in terms of if you improve your coordination you are going to be better when you're learning to do kick-ups because yeah. you're better coordinated yeah. if you improve your single leg strength you're going to be able to balance on one leg and do that or or yeah. you know receive better on one off one foot yeah. or receive you know so you need, need to work on point. exactly so yeah. even though if you are exposed to slightly more s and c and slightly less technique work yeah um i don't think the 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 handoff would be that drastic that you can't you can't do a bit more of one than the other. And like I said, I think like one thing you- I really definitely, well, no, like- As in, I'm not saying you do 50-50, right. but I'm saying if you had three technical sessions, three sessions where you're getting exposure to technique a week, plus your match on the Sunday, and you did two S&C sessions a week at a slightly younger age, not compared, throughout the whole season. Compared to a player that's doing, that's doing six technicals. Six, te te six technicals. Yeah. 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 yeah, and I see that, I see yeah. that. That's more the point I'm yeah. trying to make. Yeah. Um, I would, I would, and would you- yeah, I mean, if again, if we zoom out and we look at injury trends over the past, you know, 10 years in with young athletes, we tend to see the same things happening again and again and again. You know, what we're trying to do is to now elevate and educate and, and change what's happening alongside you know, the increased demand in, in technical proficiency that mm. is no doubt massively high and increasing. We're trying to find some way to balance this. And I don't think there's, you know, there's no right or wrong, there's no set rules. It's gonna uh, vary drastically depending on the individual, For sure. um, which is really important. Um, but, you know, let's not forget where, as a physical gold standard, where we need to get them. And that that also is going to take time to build. And yes, it's more fun and play and an unstructured, unstructured exposure to learn transferable skills and pick up a, a wide range of of, uh, of skills at a young age. But then it is we do need to start loading them. We do need to progressively build that if we are going to get to that stage. You know, mm. it, it has to start somewhere um, because it's a long journey. You can't just go, oh, today I'm I'm gonna start lifting 1.5 times my body weight. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. So it, it, there needs to be uh, a unison and a joined up approach to it, but I don't see, and we, we definitely see at the lab how 
it, it can work hand in hand um, of, of them pushing themselves technically both w with their club and in other areas, other sessions, other coaches, yeah. whilst also building this broad base and developing strength. Mm. It can be it can be done, but it it requires a join up approach and some some sharing of information. I've got two more questions, and we've got four minutes left. <laughs> Let's go. Quick fire round. These in. Yeah, um, but you were talking there about like seeing injuries, and it just prompted my mind to think about um, an article I read recently about injuries um, in women's football. And I don't know if you saw that. There's a, it's a lot of the uh, pro women who are getting um, ACL injuries oh, yeah. now. Why is that? Um, so we said uh, again th through maturation, body composition changes that will alter the level of their strength in relation to their body weight. Okay. Um, alongside that, we've got considerations of the menstrual, cy menstrual cycle. Oh, so yeah. we've got um, a lot of training that you know women are going to be um outputs are going to be severely decreased um at certain times depending on their menstrual cycle so there needs to be um a lot more consideration of fatigue on an individual level and how hard to then push or back off depending on on that stage of the menstrual cycle um ACL injuries, really high, always been really high. With women. With women. Um, it's continued that way. Again, based off our conversations, it would be how strong are you in relation to your body weight? Can you hit these markers? Are you working? Is it a long program that's been working towards these, these gold standards? Um, because if we're not there, um, I'm then going to go, okay, so we're still getting these injury rates. What's the background? What's what's the foundation we've set and where are we at currently in terms of our, our relative strength? Mm -hmm. How robust and strong are we? Uh, because if we're not there, that might be an easy one to go, okay, right, well, if I can just maintain my strength throughout the season, if I continually build it, um, you know, I might be less likely to incur these kind of common injuries that other females are, are getting that maybe aren't, at those markers oh, or aren't okay. at those those relative strength levels who aren't haven't had th that background or, or foundation of uh, drip feeding long-term athlete development um so yes it is a re it's a common theme um and it's something that you know isn't great and we can we need to try and address um but i think that might be a, a starting point um fair enough okay to to assess and then l last question is actually to you two um so yeah so what have what have you learned from the episode like what are you have you are you going to change any of the approach for your children yeah, yeah gonna get him in straight away and he's well, with, harry. <laughs> with harry yeah, 100%. yeah um what how many times a week two times a week he said <laughs> it depends but now nah, come on i think he's 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 painted a, a really clear picture of what it looks like at a young age uh, and the benefits and how important it is um and yeah, I'm I, I believe in 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 the strength and conditioning side, um, and yeah, it's just it's painted a clearer uh, picture in my head. Yeah, me too. For me, I think it's the 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 lifelong journey that 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 uh, an athlete goes through, um, and the things that you can do alongside the early stages of their development and and learning. Um, and more things like, yeah, just putting obstacles in his way so he has to jump over them and, and, and taking your child through different planes mm. and, yeah, probably take him to trampoline park and mm. that kind of thing and, and make sure he does the martial arts and yeah. does swimming um, and, and those types of things. Has it has it changed your perception of, of SNC or what you maybe thought bit, it was? Yeah, definitely. Definitely a clearer picture of what it looks like clearer at a young picture. age. Yeah. yeah. And maybe how much you should be doing definitely yeah. a clearer picture so yeah thank you for that and yeah. for me i mean obviously even like working at chelsea but not knowing like what goes on even just you describing the conversation that you would have with one of the other co lead coaches and the input that you would give and the effect that, that would have on how that coach is now working with that player um, how everything, are decisions made? How decisions are made? Is. Exactly. Um, maybe some like growth in that area as well, where we're we're maybe underperforming, and we, and we could maybe improve conversations there. Yeah. I'd say the depth, um, the depth of how much 
you understand about the athlete. So um, maturation, yeah. how much they're growing, measuring Absolutely. their weight, measuring their height, um, you know, all, all the different things that, that you talked about, I think are really important to understand. And yeah, not, not use as excuses, but also, but have open and honest conversations about how much to load the athlete with. Definitely. Yeah. Really, really nice. No, class, Harry. Thank you so much. Thank you very Harry. much, Harry. 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 I've loved coming you. on. So thanks so much. Brilliant. Quality.